God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden, and I hope you'll stick around with me now for the next hour. I've got some great scriptures to share with you. And this is a wonderful day. I want to, again, thank the management of K98 Talk and the Lord Jesus Christ for this opportunity to share with you today. And I hope you'll join with me, and well, we'll both be blessed as we join through this day. Today I'm going to be sharing with you about one of the scriptures it's probably the most popular scripture in this in the Bible. If you've watched uh, sporting uh, events on TV and you'll see somebody holding up a sign that says John 3:16, or in other uh, you know big gatherings, sometimes you know when you're watching on television, there'll be somebody there with a sign John 3:16. Well, today I want to share with you a little bit about John 3:16. And to start off with that, naturally, here is the verse. John 3.16 and 17. I'm going to add that on to it. The next verse following it. But anyway, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him, that is his Son, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now, I'm going to read it with a little bit of uh, comments added into it. Okay. For God so loved the people of the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that Jesus should suffer, endure the loneliness and sufferings of the perfect walk of faith, and the painful sufferings of the seven sprinklings of his blood on the cross by the thorns on his head, the plucking of his beard, 
the nails in his two feet and two hands and the terrible stripes on his back, the seven sprinklings of Jesus' blood as he was dying on the cross to fulfill the sacrifice in the Old Testament of the lamb without blemish and the sprinkling of the blood of the lamb before the mercy of God. Now God in his mercy allowed these sufferings of Jesus so that all of God's already pre-elected and predestined people to die and go to heaven that they would actually die and go to heaven. <clears throat> now do you see what's happened here? When uh, people say that we are predestined and were elected prior to birth to die and go to heaven or die and go to hell see that is taking away all the work of Jesus and his dying on the cross and suffering for us his his whole life and work if only predestined or elected people prior to their birth will go to heaven then there's no need for the work and suffering of Jesus on the cross and his lonely walk of faith here no one's destiny would ever be changed by Jesus suffering and death on the cross for our sins and salvation because everything required for our salvation would have already been done prior to our birth by God's act of electing and predestining us to heaven or hell before birth. So there wouldn't be anything left to be done here on earth for our salvation. It would already be set before birth. Now, after God has predestined us to heaven or hell, you know, there would be no more in heaven or earth that needs to be done. It, it, it would be finished when we arrived, when we were born. Now, <clears throat> so with all of Jesus' suffering and work here, his lonely walk of faith, his uh, persecution and everything, death on the cross, all this, What's happening here then? Why did he go through all that if we're already predestined to heaven or, or hell? Because regardless of what happened here on earth, it wouldn't change our status. Those predestined to heaven are going to go to heaven. Those predestined to hell are going to go to hell. So, so what's happening here is the devil hates Jesus so much that he's come up with this Calvinistic devilish deceived theology that we're predestined prior to birth to heaven and that would make all the suffering and work of Jesus as our Savior totally unnecessary totally worthless and and Jesus totally useless see his whole life would have been useless because everything about our salvation everything would have already been determined his life and death on the cross would not change anything because the people would have already been predestined or elected to heaven before they were born. Now, if you've been believing that, what should you do? You can see now it's ridiculous because it just eliminates all the need for Jesus' work makes it you know unnecessary completely totally unnecessary if people are predestined prior to birth to heaven or hell as the Calvinists teach well what should you do if you happen to have been believing that well do like the first thing the apostle well the apostle Paul he was called Saul on the road to Damascus when he was going out to persecute Christians and Jesus struck him down and uh, spoke to him and you know told him said Paul Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, what was his response? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And then when Jesus responded and said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. The first thing, the, the, not the Apostle Paul then, he became the Apostle Paul, but Saul on the road there, the first thing he did when he found out that he was wrong, that he was right backwards, he was persecuting Christians, and he was persecuting Jesus and doing that. Saul's reaction was in Acts chapter 8, verse 6 Lord, what will thou have me do? See, he loved God enough 
he wanted to know what he needed to do when he recognized and when Jesus told him that he had been wrong. Now, any of you listening that have been believing that people are predestined prior to birth to heaven or hell, you can see that completely erases all of the purpose of Jesus' life coming to, you know, be our Savior. What should you do? I'd say to you, first thing, ask Jesus to forgive you for teaching such a devilish lie, denying his work. Ask God the Father to forgive you for teaching that he hates people and predestines people to hell and a lake of fire. Now, you say, well, what about God hates Esau? I'm going to show you that in a minute in the scripture. God did not say he hated Esau. And since you've not understood salvation correctly, I think it would be, you know, to your benefit and, and be very wise thing for you to do would be to you know search these scriptures out stop teaching what you're teaching about you know God you know predestining people to heaven to hell and start studying Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 verse 8 it says in there for by grace are you saved through faith along with that study Ezekiel 36 26 or God prophesied the new covenant that he was going to have with us. And that new covenant, he said, A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you. See, study these scriptures was kind of like the foundation. But look through all the New Testament to all the different scriptures. I'm going to read a few in a minute that have to do with salvation. To get a better understanding of it. Because, you know, we need to make the choice here personally to receive Christ in our heart, to create in us a new heart, a new life. So, if you've been believing and teaching that people are predestined prior to birth to heaven or hell, get these two scriptures as your foundation and go through a, a deep study of all the other scriptures that talk about salvation. And... And you've got to know personally that you have received the changed heart with the Spirit of Christ living in your heart. Because Romans 8 9 says, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, Jesus also says that no one has ever been born elected or predestined to die and go to the lake of fire in Matthew 25 41 Jesus states depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels the lake of fire was not prepared for any person not one person has been born on this earth to go to the lake of fire predestined to go to the lake of fire to heaven or hell we have to make a free will choice. We have to make a choice to receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior because God wants people that love Him, that care for Him. He wants us to choose Him. He's made all these provisions for us. But now we must make our response. And our only positive response is to say, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. And I commit my life to you. Now, many people are going to find out too late that they have not received the new changed heart, that they've not been born of the Spirit, as Jesus says in John chapter 3, been born again of the Spirit into the family of God, as he stated. And also in Galatians 4, 6, and 7, it says, And because your sons God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore you no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, we have to call out to him. Our salvation comes, though, when he responds to our call. Jesus is the highest name. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. So we call out to Jesus and ask forgiveness of our sins and invite him to come into our heart, commit our life to him. And see, just saying those words now are not salvation. Saying those words are calling to Jesus. His response is to us is our salvation when he responds and sends his spirit to live in our heart 
Christ living in us. Christ, our hope of glory. When he sends his spirit to come into our heart, his spirit comes in then, and that is our salvation. His spirit coming into our heart as a result of our cry out to him. In fact, uh, people in the Old Testament had to do that too. In Job 33, 27, 28, it says, God looked upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. See, they're confessing their sin. They realize it profited them not. And he, God, will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see the light. But see, there's a big, big difference, though, between what their, uh, God's response to them and to us. God's response to them was to forgive their sins, cover their sins until the next sacrifice or the next offering. He forgives our sins, like it says in 1 John 1, 9. He forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses our heart then. And, and that's what the prophecy was about in Ezekiel 36, 26, where after we ask forgiveness, God said he's going to give us a new heart. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. That's his spirit in us, Christ. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. See, he comes to live in us. People of the Old Testament didn't receive that cleansing, didn't receive his spirit in their heart. They just received the forgiveness and the covering of the sin until the next sacrifice. But the new covenant that we have, that great work of grace, see, and that because of Jesus, uh, perfect walk of faith as being our perfect sacrifice, lamb without blemish, and uh, sacrificing or shedding his blood seven times on the cross to fulfill the sprinkling of the blood requirements of the Old Testament sacrifice. And see, the devil hates that so much. He's doing everything he can to keep people from finding out the great work of grace that we could receive in our heart if we turn to the Lord and invite him to come in. And he's trying to take away every way he can from Jesus' work. And, and that's what is happening with being predestined and everything. See, if, if a person is predestined to heaven or hell, Jesus' work here on earth for us didn't make any difference. Because see, we're going to be predestined when we get here. And there's not going to be any change. So it's not going to make any difference. But that is not the way it is. That is not. It's a lie of the devil. And he's trying to keep people confused and to keep them from receiving the great work of grace in their heart. Now, for those of you who've been believing and teaching that and everything, what will happen now that you've been understanding, teaching, preaching salvation wrong for your life? So I'm concerned about you listening right now. Not the whole world right now, but you know, you listening right now. You may be a Christian who's just been deceived and are teaching errors to other people. See? You may have Christ in your heart. I don't know. You know, that's between you and the Lord and everything. But you need to find out for sure. You may think you're a Christian like a uh, situation I was in for about 20 years. I grew up in a Baptist children's home. Age 9, I thought I'd become a Christian. And for years, I, you know, taught, you know, in, in churches and like this, you know, teaching Bible classes, things like this. But, you know, I found out, though, after about 20 years uh, that I wasn't a Christian. So as you go through this new search here of salvation, you may find out during a search of the scriptures, you know, you may realize that you've never received the changed heart and been born of the Spirit into the family of God. Whatever you do, though, do not let pride cause you to resist the possibility that you may not have the Spirit of Christ and the new changed heart as a child of God in you if you've been teaching and preaching people are predestined prior to you know birth to go to heaven or hell see because you've got some confusion there somewhere if you believe that because it's exactly opposite it's not the truth it's a lie of the devil now we've all made mistakes and receiving jesus into your heart is only a prayer away so don't let pride hold you back or something like that you can you can even do it right now as you're listening I was so glad to find out that I'd received the changed heart after all those years of thinking and trying to kind of like live a, a good, empty life of my own. But when I received the Spirit of Christ in my heart, it was such a great change, such a great work, everything. I wish I'd found out sooner. But, but any time you find out, right now even, it's fantastic. And now is the time of salvation. Uh, 
Scripture says that. It says, Behold, the day is the day of salvation. Now, regardless of condition you may find yourself, I suggest that now you need to halt your teaching and focus on the Scriptures of salvation until you can understand the born-again process of receiving the changed, new, clean heart with the Spirit of God or Spirit of Christ in you that changes you from a creature of God to actually a child of God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. We are all new creatures in Jesus. We are now children of God. The old creature does not exist. All has become new. You know, this is this is even better than you know a tadpole turned into a frog. This is better than a you know a caterpillar turned into a beautiful butterfly. Because see, that's what happens in our heart. Our heart. Like he said in Ezekiel 36, 26, he won't, a new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. That's a born-again experience of becoming a child of God. That each of us must, you know, have, you know, uh, take place in our heart and life to become a child of God, a Christian. Now, all of our Christian life and teaching must be based on the foundation of the changed heart that Christ creates in us when we turn from and ask his forgiveness for our sin, invite him to come into our hearts and lives, and we become children of God. And that's what's missing in the teaching across our nation. You don't hear preachers teaching about the joy of the great change, the joy of the changed heart, the changed life, Christ in us, you know. They're teaching theories and philosophies and, you know, live this way, principles. You know, uh, you do something or your your wife or your children do something and then you're supposed to respond a certain way and, you're, you know, they're just principles and things. But it's not a principle that we live by. We live by Christ in our heart and he teaches us and walks with the day. All the action or activity that Christ does in our heart and life to forgive, create a new heart, change us from being only a creature of God to becoming a child of God, that's called a work of grace. This is a work of grace when His Spirit comes in us and, and you know, takes away that old heart and cleans it, and, you know, puts in a new heart and puts His Spirit in us and we become a child of God. That transformation and everything, that's called a work of grace. Grace is any work of the Spirit of God in our hearts at salvation, and grace is a work of the Spirit of God, Christ, in our hearts in during the rest of our lives as we fellowship with Him daily. There's no grace in the Old Testament. So many people preach that you know the grace in the Old Testament because it was misinterpreted about 60, 70 times in the Old Testament. But that should have been mercy or truth back there in those interpretations. But now... There was no grace. Jesus, grace came by Jesus, as in John 1.17, it says, grace and truth came by Jesus. He was the only one in the Old Testament had the Spirit of God in him because he was born with the Spirit of God in him. He was from birth. Now, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came back to live in man's hearts. And that's when the new covenant, the, the Christ in us, our hope of glory, took place. Now, uh, mercy is God working on or around us. But grace is always a work of the Spirit in us. A very big difference because in us, I'm going to read you some scriptures that uh, in, in just a minute that will show you some of the things that the, the disciples and different people used terminology and everything to try to, you know, uh, show how great the work of grace is. But now, do not let the devil deceive you into thinking that because of pride or seeing the work of uh, work of the Lord around you, like you might be in a ministry, and there may have been things happening in it that you know uh, you could see God working miracles. Well, see, God works around us in His mercy and everything. But listen, if, and and you've seen God working miracles in your ministry or your life. These miracles are not the assurance or confidence that you're truly saved, because see, it's got to be the Spirit in you. I recognize God those 20-something years I wasn't a Christian. I recognize God working in uh, my life sometimes. I recognize God working around in a church and things like this. But if you've believed all these years that you don't have to personally ask God's forgiveness your sins and invite Him in your heart because you feel you've been elected or predestined, look at what Jesus states in Matthew chapter 5, 
excuse me, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Now these are a lot of great people that have done a lot of great works or seen a lot of great works in their life. And listen to what Jesus is going to say to them. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, you can be doing God's work, speaking his word, and feel sure that you're saved and everything because you see these miracles happening. But see, God backs up his word. If, you know, regardless of who speaks his word, he backed up his word through the donkey to Balaam. You might be close to God and, and know a lot of, you know, his word in your head like I did for all those years and pass it on to others. And those other people then benefit a great amount from the word that you've passed on to them. But unless you received his, you know, word, living word Christ in your heart and made that personal choice yourself, you're, you're just a, being a vessel, empty vessel passing his word through. Like that donkey, you know, like that passing his word through to Balaam and everything. Twenty-something years, I thought I was a Christian, knew a lot of God's word. I helped people. But I had not asked forgiveness of my sins and invited Christ to come into my heart and committed my life to him. To become a child of God, born again, a new creature. And that's what each of us must do. It says in John 10, 13, uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, we've got to call on the Lord. Excuse me, that's Romans 10, um, excuse me, 13. We've got to call upon the Lord. You know, we've got to respond to him. He's already set everything up for us here. And, and Jesus has made the way available and everything. But our response through faith is to humble ourselves and turn to him and ask his forgiveness of our sins and invite him to come into our heart. Then his response to us then, he sends his spirit into our heart to create a new heart, a new life. We're born again a new creature with the Spirit of Christ in our heart. You must be born again by the Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, and don't let pride of all this great work you've done through the years maybe and you know going to church all this time, don't let that pride and everything stand between you and the one you love, Jesus. Invite Jesus, invite Christ into your heart now, for that is why he led you to this message this morning. So pray and invite him to come into your heart and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. This great work of Christ in our hearts, which results in us becoming children of God, is why the devil fights Jesus' work on the cross and the work of grace in us so much. Through the devil's confusion and everything, the devil wants to, you know, just as many people as possible to miss becoming a child of God and to go off into the lake of fire with him because see he knows that's where he's going and the only thing he can do now Jesus has already provided the perfect walk Jesus already had the victory over him and he's already defeated and so now all he can do is try to take people with him as many as he can and that's the only way the devil can hurt Jesus now because Jesus is going to suffer every time he has to send someone off in the lake of fire. He's sending someone off in the lake of fire that he loves with a perfect love. Think of how much you love your little cute little granddaughter, or cute little grandson, or something like this, your cute little baby. And, and how would you like to stand there and, and tell your grandson, granddaughter, depart from me in the lake of fire, eternity of punishment. See, that's the way it's going to be. And even more so, every time Jesus has to send someone to the lake of fire because they've rejected him. And it's going to be terrible. But that's the only way the devil can get back at him anymore is to deceive people and cause them to miss receiving Christ in their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. We'll take a short break now and I'll be right back. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, 
go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. And you know, as Christians, we have a new heart from God and the Spirit of Christ, God's power in us. God is love, and His Spirit is in our hearts. In John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love, God, casts out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love or God yet. So in James 4, 7, the scripture says, Submit therefore to God, or His Spirit in you, Resist the devil, fear, and he, the devil in fear, will flee from you. When you start getting apprehensive about something, like starting to fly or a storm coming, looking ahead at what might happen to you in your job, your health, don't just worry and think about these future events, or maybe something that you're even going through right now. Philippians 4, 6 says, When you start getting anxious, turn to God then, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Your request and your concerns be known to God. Worrying won't help you one bit, but it will cause you to miss God's blessings to you during that time. So, choose, make the choice yourself to set yourself in submission to God in prayer, talking to God, and counting your blessings from past things, experiences with God. Then watch the devil and fear flee from you. Now, always let your anxiety be a red flag to remind you to pray. God loves you. He will hear you. And in First Colossians one twenty seven, Christ in us, our hope of glory. So have a good day. God bless you. And be set free. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome back. Now I'm going to continue here and share some scriptures now of this great work of grace, of the great work in our heart that takes place when we invite him, we invite Jesus to come into our heart, when we ask him to forgive us our sins, and invite him to come in, commit our life to him, and then his response then, like in Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, where God says, A new heart also will I give you. See, he's going to give us a new heart. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. It'll be his spirit. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. And then see, that's when we make the transformation from just being a creature here on earth. God's one of God's creature, and he loved us just as much like that now. He loved us with a perfect love. That's why he wants us to come into his family. But he wants us to choose him. He's chosen all of us. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm going to share some scriptures to give a like descriptive views of how we can kind of understand better what happens when Christ comes in our hearts, and creates a new heart, and baptizes us in the family of God. I think this will help you know us understand the vastness of the work of grace, the inability to describe that process, and the great work that Christ has created in each of us, and just how special we each are in His eyes. In fact, the scripture tells us that God is, has something so special for each of us. In uh, 
2 Timothy 2.9. The scripture states, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was created in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now see, he has something so special for you, for me. A person will never feel satisfied. A person will never have that peace and joy and know that their eternity is taken care of here on earth until you know that you're seeking his perfect calling for your life. You'll never have that joy. You'll always have this kind of apprehension or something like that that, you know, uh, 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 well, could even lead to a fear of death because of not knowing that you're prepared to meet the Lord. Listen to some of these verses now. In James 1.21, James says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, see, here he's talking about engrafting things, like, you know, to cause to grow together from, like a tree, you know, different plants, atoms infused together and become one. An old vine provides life to the new limb. The new limb is totally dependent upon the vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you know, and, and he is our life. We're totally dependent on him. We've been infused or engrafted into the body of Christ. First Peter, First Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, you know, like the corruptible seed that our dad, you know, put in our mother, you know. Well, not of corruptible seed. We're being born again now of incorruptible seed, the pure word of God, by the living word of God, Christ, which liveth and abideth forever. And in Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham his seed were the promises made, and he says, Not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, to thy seed, which is Christ, Christ the incorruptible seed, word of God. Now, and then like in uh, John 3, 5 through 16, where Jesus says, you know, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. We must be born of the Spirit into the body of Christ. He cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born by the Spirit into the, the body of Christ. He says that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. See, we become a new creature. Like I was mentioning before, you know, like how a tadpole changes over to a frog and a, a caterpillar to a butterfly. But our change is even greater than that. We change from a creature of God. He gives us a new heart, a new life, forgives our sins, and we become a child of God. And you must be born again. Or like a cucumber. You know, when you pickle a cucumber, you, you get that you know, pickling all throughout the cucumber. That's the way we are. When we uh, receive Christ in our heart, we're a new creature. And we can't be unpickled. Neither can pickles be unpickled. But anyway, just we, we've been changed inside. We may look a lot the same on the outside, but we're, we're not inside. Galatians 4, 6, And because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou no more a servant but a son? And if a son... An heir of God through Christ. See, we become a joint heir with Jesus to all of God's promises. It, it just, we're, we're a child of God. We're not the same person we were before when he came in and created us a new heart, a new life. In him. And it says in Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. We will not receive the uh, spirit of a, bo a bondage again to fear, like a little message I put in the middle of the broadcast a while ago. But you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. Romans 8, 9. Now, if you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God now dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, that is a dividing point of when we become a child of God, a Christian, and are no more just God's creation, but we're now one of his children. It's when the spirit of Christ comes into our heart. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken and enliven your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Have you received the spirit of Christ in your heart? There's no way you can't know it. Because when you see yourself as a dirty sinner, heart filled with lust and all this, and then you, you, you cry out and you want help, you want that burden lifted, everything, you cry out to 
God, is, oh, forgive me. Come into my heart. Save me. You don't have to say those exact words. Just say, oh, God, help. And when he comes in and lifts those burdens, when he comes in and creates a new heart, a new life, and puts his uh, salvation, puts his spirit in you, the spirit of love, God is love, you will know it. If you have any doubt whatsoever today whether you have received the spirit of Christ, I don't care what you've believed before. But if you have any doubts whatsoever, turn to him with all your heart. Because that is the only way we get into heaven is turning to him and inviting him to come into our heart and life to change us into a child of God because it's his children he's going to come for. When I missed one of the verses I wanted to share with you just a minute ago, but listen to this from Peter in first let's see, Peter three, twenty one. And like figure wherein the baptism does also now save us. Now, baptism, you know, that washing and cleansing of the heart, giving us a new heart, a new life. And like the Apostle Paul says in, what is it, um, Romans 12, 13, says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into the body of Christ. The of Christ isn't there, but it's baptized into the body by one spirit. And here Peter's talking about, it. like figure where even baptism does also, <coughs> excuse me, save us, not the putting away of the fills of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by his resurrection spirit coming into our heart, creating the new heart, the new life. That's how we then are changed into the new creature, a child of God, not by the just washing of water or something like that from water baptism. So now I want to share with you a couple of scriptures here. I mentioned just a minute ago. about uh, <clears throat> the scripture in Malachi that seems to indicate that God said he hated Esau. God has never hated anyone. Like Jesus said in Matthew 21, 45, um, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal lake of fire, created for the devil and his angels. See, uh, God has not hated anybody and allowed them to be born here on earth to die and go to hell. It's not his will that any should perish. But now, in Malachi chapter 1, verse first three verses, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now listen what God says. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, he said, yet you say. Now he's going to quote back to them what they've been saying. See, there was a punctuation left out of this that, uh, you know, the scriptures won't punctuate punctuated in the original text when when people uh, interpret them everything they put in the punctuation now God says I have loved you saith the Lord yet you say now what I'm going to read now is what they're saying the lie they've been telling about God and he's he's quoting that to them and then he's going to address that and correct it yet you say Wherein has thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage to waste as the dragons of the wilderness. Now see, he's quoting to them. That's the lie they have been telling about him. And so he's addressing that through his prophet Malachi. But God says, I've loved you. Now, without knowing the story of uh, Esau's life, how God blessed him, during that 20 years Jacob was over working for his... Uh, wives and for his wealth God had already blessed Esau so much and set him up and helped him fight and clear out the giants from Mount Seir and had set Esau up into his homeland in Mount Seir because when uh, God called uh, Jacob to come back to his father's homeland you know Isaac's homeland and everything Jacob was still afraid of Esau, Jacob then sent gifts to Mount Seir. You can see that already God had fought with uh, Esau and helped him set up his homeland in Mount Seir and establish it, and Jacob sent gifts there. Well, they came together very shortly after that and met because Jacob was coming back home, and, and after they met, Jacob found out that, you know, Esau didn't still hate him. He hugged him and everything. And uh, when Esau left him, he went back to Mount Seir. Now, if you do a study on how 
Esau got to Mount Seir, you'll see God loved him. In uh, one of the first things in the, uh, what is this? Well, I don't see his verse right now, but it's one of the first verses in, uh, what is it? Joshua. That's why I couldn't think of the name. Okay, Joshua. Well, God said in Joshua, he said that he gave Esau Mount Seir for his possession. And when the children of Israel, read Deuteronomy chapter 2, when the children of Israel were coming out of uh, slavery four or five hundred years after Esau was uh, dead and Jacob were dead, God told Moses, he said, you pass by their land, he says, you pay for anything you get, they're going to be afraid of you, so do not harm them in any way. And he says, but I'm not giving you one foot of their land. You read that. Look in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2. God tells them to leave the Edomites alone. They were called Edomites, the descendants of Esau. And also, there was two others, the Moabites and Ammonites were the uh, uh, descendants of Lot's two daughters. And God told uh, Moses, when you pass by them, you leave them alone. So God was telling Moses, when they came out of the bondage and slavery, when they passed by these lands to leave the Ammonites alone, the Moabites, and the Edomites, these were all he called their brethren. See, they were relatives. And he was protecting those people. And in here, um, Esau's descendants have for four or five hundred years they've been living in Mount Seir. All this time they had been in their promised land for four or five hundred years and uh, the children of Israel are just now going to their promised land. So see God didn't hate Esau. Read and study that out. And um, In fact I have a book if you look at my website and everything a book called God Loved Esau and, and it's so simple and so easy but here God was telling the people that he didn't hate Esau He said, you know, uh, I have loved you, yet you say. Now, what happened was that it says here, saith the Lord, I loved you. Um, I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and heritage to waste. Well, see, God was protecting um, Esau's descendants when the children of Israel came by. But they attacked the children of Israel and killed some of them. And that's when Esau's descendants brought the curse of God on them. Because, you know, to, in Genesis to uh, Abraham, God had said, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And that was passed down to Isaac, his descendants, Jacob, his descendants. And 400 years later, when the children of Israel were coming out of the promised land, and um, Esau's descendants attacked uh, the children of Israel and killed some of them, that's when the curse came on uh, Esau's descendants. Not the man Esau. He was blessed his whole life. Read that story and study it out. Anyway, I'll get my book and read it. It's a little, little bit simpler there. Well, uh, God addressed people like this <clears throat> quite often when he's trying to uh, reach out to them. In uh, Isaiah 49, verses 13 to 16, here through the, like Malachi, you know, he reached out to people and said, I have loved you, yet you say, you know, yet they're lying. And he's repeating back to them their lie. Well, here, through the prophet Isaiah, he's repeating back to these Zionists the lie they have been telling about him. Okay, listen to this. Isaiah 49, 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, see, just like the children of Israel back there. God said, I've loved you, yet you say. Now he's saying here, but Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. And then God responds and says, see, that's a lie they're telling is that God has forsaken them. Now God responds back and says, can a woman forget her sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. See, he's straightening out this lie that they've been telling. 
about him. And so he does that throughout the scriptures like that. God didn't say Becker and Malachi hated um, Esau. That was a lie that they had been telling about him, and he was trying to straighten that up. So God has never hated anybody. Like Jesus says, that uh, the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels, not one person. And you say, well, what about the Pharaoh? That, you know, God hardened his heart. Well, the Pharaoh was under the curse of God, too, because all those Pharaohs uh, that had turned and put the children of Israel in bondage, see, they were persecuting the children of Israel. And God says, I'll bless those that bless thee, and I'll curse those that curse thee. All of those people were under the curse of God that was um, holding the children of Israel in bondage and persecuting them everything. So, but God gave that Pharaoh nine opportunities to turn from that curse and let his children go. Let his children go. The tenth time, the tenth time, God said, okay, I'm going to harden his heart and be glorified. But see, he had had nine opportunities. Even, even while he was under the curse of God, God still wanted to get him out of that you might say anyway take a look at that so God did not say he hated Esau in an election let me look at a couple of verses here on election so that you'll see then that election is not to um, salvation 1 Peter 1.10 <clears throat> make your calling and election sure for if you do these things you shall never fail now if election meant predestination to salvation prior to birth there'd be no reason for Peter to include election in this verse. It'd be impossible for an elected person to fail. See? There wouldn't be any need for him to say that. Uh, listen to Paul in 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Now, if the elect here means people that are already, you know, chosen and children of God, listen to this now. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's saying the elect have got to receive the salvation of Jesus Christ too. So these elect here couldn't have been predestined already to heaven because they would have already received it. See? So it can't mean that. Well, my clock is saying I'm about out of time here. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the Apostle Paul states who gets sent off into eternity of fire. He says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So when, when God brings people... Uh, to a knowledge of their sins, to a knowledge of Jesus. Jesus says in John 6, 45, and they shall all be taught of God. So when God brings people that knowledge and they reject the love of his words, then they will go off into eternity. He's going to make his uh, love known to all of us. So in, uh, let's see, what is it? 1 Timothy 5, 21. <clears throat> now this is about as clear as you can get that uh, election is not to salvation, but it's to service. Paul says, I charge thee before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before the other, doing nothing but partiality. See, elect angels? Are you saying election means to salvation? Angels are going to get saved? Some of them are going to get saved? No, angels don't get saved. Angels don't preach, teach have anything to do with the gospel. When Cornelius was missing salvation, good man, Acts chapter um, 9 and 10, it says he was one of the best men in town, prayed always, gave alms, but he was missing something. And what he was missing was Christ in his heart. But he didn't know that. You know, he was a great, good man. God sent him a vision, and an angel in a vision told him, go send after Simon, with Simon Peter, Go send after Simon, and he'll tell you what you need to do. See, the angel didn't tell Cornelius about salvation. The angel didn't, you know, witness to him or anything like that. See, 
angels are just to carry messages like that, not to preach and teach or anything. Peter, uh, I mean, yeah, Peter came then and told Cornelius that he needed Jesus. If you look in his, uh, it says Acts chapter 10, I think. But if you look in that and read the message that Peter preached to Cornelius, it was all about Jesus, all about Jesus. And they received that, those living words into their heart, burst out shouting and praising God, speaking in tongues and everything. And then they got baptized, water baptized and everything. But see, that's what was missing. As good a person as he was, without Christ, he was going to hell. But God sent him a message, not telling the angel to preach to him. As Paul says here, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Now see, that would indicate that there are some angels that were, might say, saved. <laughs> and there are some angels that weren't saved because he's talking here to just the elect angels. See, so that, that, that can't mean salvation. None of them. So put all these scriptures together like that and see what you think of Calvinism. It is a total error, total lies. The devil is trying to get people confused and think that they don't have to do anything here, that God's already predestined everybody this way or that way. And it's not true because, again, Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Then shall the king say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> the everlasting fire was never prepared for any of us as people. We go there because we reject the Lord Jesus Christ and his love. So, good day and God bless you. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.